Hey everyone, Professor Hank here. So today we're gonna to take a look at writing basic methods in Java. Specifically, we'll take a look at the flow of execution, how you can pass arguments to methods, how you can return values for methods, and how you can invoke methods. So let's go ahead and get started. So to start with, let's talk about the execution of a program. And to do that, we have to review a little bit about what makes up a Java program. Now, every Java program is gonna have at least one class with a special method inside of it named main. So here you can see that I've got a class named demo and we've got this method named main and it has these keywords here, public, static, void. And then this is the name of the method right here. And this is its parameter list which is going to accept an array of strings. So this is the main method and the execution for all Java programs begins here. So execution begins here. So this is where everything starts. And so the very first statement inside of this main method is the first one that's going to get executed. So for example, if I do system.out.println and I say hello and I run this, then you're gonna see, you know, we've got hello in the output right there. Okay, so that's the first statement that executes. Now, if I add another statement such as world, then that's gonna be the second statement that executes. So it's gonna be top down, starting with the very first statement in this special method named main. You can see there is the hello world. So let's go ahead and add another method. So we'll start off with these keywords, public, static, void, just like our main method. And then we can name this whatever we want and we'll name it method one. And then we'll add a couple parentheses here and then opening and closing curly braces. So void here is gonna be our return type. Method one is our name and these parentheses here are our parameter list or make up our parameter list. Right now it's empty. And then in between these curly braces, we're gonna go all the statements that we wanna be able to execute on command. And we'll do that through a function call. Now, we're making this static. We're including that static keyword here because we're gonna be calling this method from our main method, which is also static. Therefore, it has to be static in our new method as well. So now if I do something like this, if I say system.out.println, and maybe I say calling method one, something like that, right? Now, whenever I call this method, this statement here is going to be executed. So what does a function call or a method call look like? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have the name of the method and then I'm gonna have parentheses here and we'll talk more about how to use these here in a second and then my little semicolon. So this right here is the method call. So remember how the execution happens? It's gonna start with this statement here and then it's gonna to go to the statement here and then it's gonna to go to our method call, which is gonna jump the execution up to our method definition and then start executing the statements inside of the method, similarly to how they're executed in main from top to bottom. So this is gonna be the entry point for our method one. And so let's go ahead and run that and see how that goes. So you can see there's the hello and there's the world and then there's calling method one. So we executed this statement, we executed this statement, we executed this statement, which jumped us up to our method one, executing the contents of that method. And then as soon as that was done, we came back and then the program was over. So what do we become back? Well, if I was to do system.out.println, goodbye here and run it again, you'll see what I'm, you'll see what I'm talking about, right? So hello world, line 11 executes, line 12, the hello, and then the world. Line 13, the method call, which jumps us up to line six, and then we see the call it, calling method one statement. And then as soon as that's done, we leave method one and we go back from whence we came and execution resumes executing there to line 14, where we display goodbye. And then we hit the closing curly brace here. And so then our program terminates. Now we can put multiple statements inside of a method, just like we did with our method main. So maybe I'll do something like entering method one, and then I'll do something like system.out.println hi from method one. And then maybe I'll do something like .out.println goodbye from method one. And then when we run this this time, when we run it this time, you're gonna see that all three of those statements inside of method one get executed, right? So line 13 happens, we see hello. Line 14 happens, we see world. Line 15 happens, we jump up to method one, start executing on the first line inside that method. Line six says entering method one. That's line six. Line seven says hi for method one. Line eight happens, goodbye for method one. And then we return 
from whence we came, which was the method call, and then we continue executing with line 16, which is goodbye, right? Now we can call the same method as many times as we want. So I can do something like this, and you'll see that we're gonna end up executing this chunk of code three times, once for each method call. So let's see that in action. Okay, so now you can see that we had that execute, those three statements execute three separate times. So this gives us the benefit of being able to write overall fewer lines of code because when I called method one here, these three statements executed. So I just needed to have these three method calls here rather than having these three lines of code repeated three times. So I end up with an overall shorter program that way. Another benefit is that it makes the program more modular. So I can say, well, this method is responsible for doing this one particular task. And so then anytime I need that task executed, I call that method, I invoke that method. And so if anything goes wrong uh, with my program, with the task that is been designated to or been assigned to method one, well, then I know where to go look for the problem right away. I know that uh, method one is probably where my problem is if the task assigned to method one isn't executing correctly. So let's now talk about arguments and parameters. So we can pass data into a method and then have it perform some kind of operation on that data. So let us say that I created a method called add two numbers. So if I'm going to do that and I want to give this method two numbers to add, then I'm going to need a couple of parameters, right? So inside the parentheses there, this is our parameter list. So I want to add two numbers. So I'm going to need to pass two numbers to this method. So I'm going to need two parameters. So what parameters are, they are variable declarations that go inside of these parentheses and they have a special a special purpose. So let's just say int x and int y. So this looks very similar to declaring variables in other places within your program. It's just they go in between the parentheses and each one of these parameters gets separated by a comma. So I've got two parameters. Each of them are integer parameters. One's named x and one is named y. So what I can do then is I can perform some kind of operation such as addition, and I could print that out to the user, print that up on the screen. So now anytime I wanna add two numbers and have it show up on the screen, I can call this method. So if I go back into my main here, my main method, and I call add two numbers, add two numbers. I now have to put something inside of these parentheses like I did with print line here. What I have to do is I have to provide two arguments, two integers, two integer values that I want to be added. So let's say eight and four. Now you notice that I separated the eight and the four with a comma. What's gonna happen is the eight is gonna get copied into the X here. The four is gonna get copied into the Y here. And then this statement is gonna execute when the function's called. So the eight will be in the X, the four will be in the Y, that'll get added up. Eight plus four is 12, and that's what's gonna get displayed on the screen. So let's test that out. Okay, so you can see here's the 12, and then the goodbye. Where'd the 12 come from? Our call to this method here. Where did the goodbye come from? This call right here. So we did add two numbers, went up to our add two numbers method. The eight got copied into X, the four got copied into Y. Those two numbers got added together, sent to print line to be displayed on the screen. We returned from add two numbers to the function call from which we came, and then print line got executed and we saw goodbye on the screen. Now I can call add two numbers as many times as I like. So maybe I want to add three and nine this time and run this. And then we'll first see 12 and we'll see 12 again. Now, does that make sense? Yes, because three and nine is 12, eight and four is 12. So we called add two numbers here, added eight and four. And up here, executed this, came back down, called add two numbers, copied three and nine into X and Y. Those got added together, sent to the screen, came back to where that method was called. And then we said goodbye on the screen. So I could keep doing this all day long. So one last example here, maybe we'll do one and two. And you can make your methods as simple or as complicated as you need, right? So there you go. Okay, so this void keyword here, this is in the position for a return type for a method. So this void keyword designates add two numbers as a void method. That means it doesn't return anything. So what does that mean? That means that I can't do something say like this, int z equals add two numbers because there's no value 
coming out of the add to numbers function to be assigned to the Z variable. So how could I fix that? What, how could I do that? Can I do that? Yes, I can. What I do is I change this return type from void into a data type such as int or float or double. For example, the type of data that I want to come out of my function that I want to return from my function. So we'll make a different method to do that and we'll call that method maybe um, subtract two numbers. So it's gonna be a value returning function. So I'm gonna use a non-void data type. I'm gonna return an integer. So my return type is gonna be int and we'll call this subtract two numbers. And just keep it simple. I'll make it two integers again. And this time what I'll do is I will say return x plus y or x minus y, we're subtracting x minus y. Okay, so now when I call subtract two numbers, I'll pass two arguments, two integers, and the first integer will get copied into x, the second will get copied into y, just like with add two numbers. And then my method will calculate the difference of x and y and then return that value. I can then assign it to a variable back in my calling method and then use the value that was returned for further processing. So I could do something like this. I could say int z equals subtract two numbers and we'll subtract two from five. And then I could simply print out the z if I wanted to. I can use the value that gets returned by subtract two numbers for further processing my program. So what's gonna happen? We're gonna call subtract two numbers. The five is gonna get copied into the x up here. The two is gonna get copied into the y up here. And then the two is gonna get subtracted from the five, which is gonna give us three, which will then be returned. So when we go back to the calling function main, that three will then end up being assigned to the Z, which will then send Z to print line. And so then we'll see that number on the screen, right? So there's the three. So it's just that easy. Another thing that we can do is we can create inside of our methods, local variables variables whose scope is the method in which they are declared. Now, as it turns out, the parameters of my parameter list, and you can have zero, one, two, three, four, or more parameters. You just have to have matching arguments, a matching number of arguments within the method call, okay? But I can also create a variable inside of here. So I could do something like int difference equals x minus y, and then I can return the difference. So we do the calculation here, and then we do the return here. So are we gonna get anything different? No, it's just gonna be, the answer is gonna be the same, the output's gonna be the same. It's just a different way of writing it, and that can have some use for debugging operations. Now, one last thing I'll show you here is that we could easily put ourselves a little temporary debugging statement here, temporary output statement. If I wasn't sure if my method was working correctly, then there's no reason why I can't display the contents of my parameters and that local difference variable. So I could do something like, you know, just printing these out temporarily. So system.out.println, x, y, and then the difference, right? So then that will help me to trace through, to check to make sure that the correct values are being copied into my method, the correct calculation has been done, finding the difference, and the correct value has been returned. So we passed five and two into our X and Y, found the difference, and then within subtract two numbers, we print out the contents of X, which is five, which is what we expect, and then we printed out the contents of y, which is two, which we expect. And then we printed out the contents of difference, which is three because five minus two is three, which we expect. So we see that three. And then when we return the contents of difference back to main, that gets assigned to z. And then we print out the z and we see our three, which is exactly what we expect. Now notice that we can have methods call other methods. Obviously we had main call subtract two numbers but I could then have subtract two numbers call some other method that I've written. So I could have it call add two numbers, for example, and the parameters for subtract two numbers become the arguments for add two numbers. So when this executes, subtract two numbers is gonna get called. We'll jump up to subtract two numbers. The five will get copied to X. The two will get copied to Y. Then we call add two numbers. That five gets copied gets passed to add two numbers. That Y containing two gets passed to add two numbers. So the five and the two gets copied here and here. 
And then add two numbers is gonna do that addition. So that's gonna give us seven, which will be sent to print line, which will display that on the screen. Add two numbers will finish executing and we'll return to the method that called it right here. And then subtract two numbers will continue its work, finding the difference, returning the difference, and then going back to the method that called it right here. So that difference of five minus two is three will be assigned to the Z. And then that Z will be passed to print line containing the three, which will be displayed on the screen. And then we'll display the goodbye. So you can see the output matches our description. So this can be as simple or as complex as you need it to be. One more thing to note here, that in subtract two numbers here, this method itself does not interact with the user in any way. Notice how there are no system.out statements, for example, whereas add two numbers does, right? Because it's got system.out.println. And method one also interacts with the user. It prints out stuff on the screen. And so does main. If you had a scanner object reading input from the user, well, that would be another example of a method interacting with the user. So let us finish up with one piece of debugging advice for you. Now, obviously, if the difference, if the subtraction was wrong, then I wouldn't be looking inside of method one to find out what went wrong with the subtraction. Why not? Method one isn't tasked with finding or subtracting two numbers. It's tasked with just printing out some stuff on the screen. So if something went wrong with my subtraction, I wouldn't go look in the add two numbers method. I'd go to the method that was tasked with calculating the difference, which would be subtract two numbers. Another piece of advice I'll give you is write and test your methods one at a time. So let us assume that each one of these methods is doing exactly what I want it to do. I'm 100% confident in them. And then I decide that I'm gonna add one more method, right? These are already written. And so now I'm gonna add another method. Rather than writing them all out at one time, write them one at a time, testing each method in turn. So if I assume, based off of previous testing, that all of these methods were correct, and I decided that I was going to create a method that is going to multiply numbers, say. So I could do something like public static int multiply to numbers, and then I do my int x and my int y, similar to before. And you can have local variables that have the same name across different methods because they are in different scopes. Now, if that's too confusing for you, there's nothing stopping you from naming your parameters or your local variables, whatever you want. You can make them distinct if you want to, but it's okay. This X is not this X because they're in two separate methods, okay? But anyway, now I did multiply two numbers. So correct version of this would be to say something like return X times Y. But let's say that I made a mistake. Let's say that I returned X modulus Y. Well, what does modulus do? It gives you the remainder of division. So if I call this method and pass it a couple of numbers, such as, what do we call this? Multiply two numbers, apply two numbers. And I passed it three and two. And this is a perfectly fine syntax as well. Since this is returning an integer, you can invoke the method, you can call the method any place where an integer would be acceptable. So here I initialized Z with a call to subtract two numbers. Here I'm simply going to take the value returned by multiply two numbers and then immediately give it to print line. Okay, but if I'm going to be multiplying two numbers, I expect that this is gonna be six, right? Because three times two is six, but that's not what I'm gonna get. See here, I got one. Why? Because three divided by two has a remainder of one. That's what modulus does. So since that was the last method that I wrote, that must be where the defect is. So since I would have already have tested all the rest of the code before adding this method, I know that my problem is here and I can go straight here to try to figure out what's wrong. So I take a look at that. I make a hypothesis. Oh, I, this is modulus. It should be multiplication. Let's make that change and then test it and see if I get the correct value. And I do. All right, so that's everything that I have for you in this video. If you're a student of mine and you have any questions about the content of this video or any of the other videos in our courses, feel free to stop by my online Zoom office hours or email me through Canvas. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.